A very good evening and a warm welcome to one and all present here. I am Devulina from Clarnet. We are from Clarnet. Clarnet is India's largest live digital CME platform, which is exclusively free for doctors. And we are very happy and proud to be a part with ICA as a digital partner. You can visit our site, which is www.clarnet.com. The spelling goes C-L-I-R-N-E-T. You all are invited to visit our site. We have telemed service that you can use. We have polls and quiz. We have lots of live sessions. We have MedWikis, which is Medical Wikipedia for doctors. So now, without further delay, I would like to welcome Dr. Radha Krishnan, sir, to start with the session, who is president of ICA. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Double Na. Good evening, and welcome you all to the college webinar of Wednesday evening. Believe you are all keeping absolutely fine. And today's webinar is on certain aspects of pain management, which we were not able to discuss in the past. Before we start the webinar, I may like to remind you once again, regarding the 15th June program of ICA. It's a new way in anesthesia teaching and training open to you all. This simulation-based teaching and training, well, we'll be projecting through three different halls, same time. I may like to advise you to remain on the one hall rather than hopping around. And we'll be projecting the other two halls proceedings in the subsequent 
days. So remain on the one hall and try to catch what all be said there. I am sure this is a really interesting new area for all of you. And today's webinar we are starting. And the moderator of the day is Dr. Ashok Jordan from Tata Hospital, Jamshedpur. Ashok is helped with Dr. Gadu, Dr. Anil Agarwal, and the speakers are Dr. P. N. Jain of Tata Bombay, Naveen Hotra, the Secretary of National ISA, Bhavida Gai, Professor from PA, Chandigarh, and Ashok Jordan himself. And I request Dr. Ashok Jordan start off introducing your moderators and then our webinar. Thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. At the outset, I am really grateful to the IS, ICA leadership giving me this opportunity to moderate this particular 98th ICA webinar. And it is really a great privilege and honor to me. I will be moderating this session along with me two very senior moderators like Dr. R.P. Gedu and Dr. Anil Agrawal will be also moderating. We will be having four speakers, as you have already mentioned, Dr. P. N. Jain, Dr. Naveen Malhotra, Dr. Babita Gay, and myself will be speaking as the fourth speaker. Now, without any delay, may I request Dr. R. P. Gedu to introduce our first speaker, Dr. P. N. Jain, and start the proceedings. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, Ashok, and thank you, uh, everybody, for making me a part of this one, particularly Radha Krishnan and all. So, let me introduce the first speaker, my best friend, my best colleague, Dr. Paramanand Jain, who had been, we had been together for 25 plus years over there in Tata Memorial, and both of us were working together in the pain management. And anyway, he is a well-known national as well as international faculty as far as pain is concerned. He had been a president of the ISSP also. He had been a treasurer of ISSP. He has got a lot of publication as far as books are concerned on the pain as well as the book chapters and the lectures also, both national and international level. Right now, he's been a, doing a palliative care also, which is again, one of the very important part of the pain management. So I think Dr. P. N. Jain will be speaking today on the geriatric pain management also. Dr. Jain, please. Good evening, Dr. Gedu, for that nice introduction. And uh, I pay my regards and very good evening to Dr. Radhakrishnan and Dr. Jayashri Shud. Am I audible, please? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes. So now I will share my slides. My slides are visible to you, all of you. My slides are visible. Yes, sir, visible. Yes, sir. visible. So with that, I will be talking about pain yes, management in elderly population. Hello. Okay. So there are few learning objectives. What the audience is going to learn from this lecture is why elderly people are different from the normal adult people. How much is the prevalence of pain in elderly, common painful conditions in elderly, how to assess pain in elderly population, general treatment principles, why NSAIDs are double sorts for elderly people, and some non-pharmacular ap approaches also. So to start with, I will just say that elderly population is not same as somebody who is 30 or 40 years old. So aging increases the vulnerability to disease, but it is not a disease in itself. Even no two uh, olds are same. Some people of 70 are as fit as 50, and some are not as, as uh, they are too old. So if the, uh, as you must have seen that in diabetes that adds 10 years to your age. So, so that's aged heterogeneity is also 
exist. Persistent pain is highly common in morbid condition, costly condition in later, li later life. Untreated pain affects the sleep, social activity, and making them social isolation also. Physical function is also reduced. They stop going outside the house. They, go, they get depressed. They, 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 nobody talks to them. And everybody is busy in their own pursuits in active daily life of the world. Quality of life is also decreased due to pain. And they are generally dependent on the healthcare system, generally on the hospitals and doctors and the medicines and the equipments. So why pain is older adults? Aging is a progressive generalized impairment of function, resulting in a loss of adaptive responses to the stress and growing risk of age-related diseases. Reasons for functional decline are, of course, the biological aging disease, environmental changes on the course, disuse, loss of social support, decreased coping skills, declining health, may exacerbate the pain experience, compromising the ability to respond to the negative aspects of persistent pain. A downturn in functionality of the central pathways also occurs, which actually modulates the effects of nauseous stimuli in the cerebral cortex with aging. So it is not that the other functions, even brain becomes slow. And the misconception is that pain severity or perception decreases with aging. Is not. They, they actually perceive pain and they, they are in more pain, higher pain threshold and slower perception, atrophy of the gray matter. Their levels of hormone levels are also decreased. Okay, so that leads to impaired descending inhibition and less tolerance. Like if you give promedol that works on the 5 HT and uh, reuptake inhibitor, so that same promedol of 50 milligram tablet may make them actually start very much sedated and they start vomiting also. Less efficacy of endogenous opioids, less pain makes them vulnerable to the under treatment of pain and its consequences. Loss of pain is a burning sign. That is why you listen a lot of silent MIs, people dying in the sleep or they just vomit, they have hematemesis, painless hematemesis due to practical self. Fear of movement and all those problems are also there. The other subtle, some physiological changes with the aging, like in cardiovascular system, like in nervous system, it's a busy slide you can read on, respiratory system, renal system, all are actually decreasing in their function by 20 to 30% or sometimes 50% GI, and musculoskeletal skeletal system also is decreased. So all these doses, whatever you are giving to the drugs, all have to be adjusted. You have to individually tailor made the pain management plan for these patients in acute as well as in chronic setting. You cannot just give them the uh, one size fits all. It is not like that. So why pain is untreated in older adults? Maladaptive attitudes, denial and stoicism, aging, frailty, chronic disease, dementia. So in dementia, patient doesn't complain, though they are suffering in so, so much pain, but they do not complain because there are psychological changes, there are memory changes. If you ask a demented patient in the OPD, since when this pain is occurring, they won't be able to tell you it is one month or one year or six months or they precise, or in, even in days also, if you ask that in today is Monday, what happened to you on Saturday? How was your Saturday? So they cannot tell you what happened on Saturday. Okay. So these challenging assessment and management plans are there. You have to go very slow in your communication with them. You have to come to their level of the slowness. So pain and dementia leads to aggression, agitation, withdrawal, confusion. And you have to actually see all these things. Limited use of trained pain doctors are there. Limited access to the pain doctors are there. Highly Hardly there are, even big cities also pain, physicians are too scarce to reach to, right? Or even general physicians or GPs do not know who pain physicians are. Even now in 2021, there are no MD in pain medicine or DM in pain medicine, or there is more popular pain physician in every hospital. At least one med in every medical college, there should be a pain physician, which is also not there. So where the patients are going, 1,000 patients in OPD every day, and pain is the most common symptom in any medical college or any hospital. But pain physician will not be there. They think, or perception is in medical sciences, that when the disease is treated,
pain also is treated. So why there is a pain physician separately should be kept into the picture in the discipline. Then there are financial barriers. Nowadays, uh, if you go to private sector, it costs less. So hardly ever, uh, our 80% um, of population is without any insurance. So they are deferring going to any hospital. Attitude that hinder pain reporting and assessment and treatment is pain in old age is inevitable. Older as are less sensitive to pain. Older as are cannot tolerate a strong opioid. And nothing can be done to relieve their pain. So all these things are going on. That leads to the, all the barriers uh, to uh, pain, effective pain management. And pain is unique sensation, actually. Like we have having five sensations. So pain should be considered the sixth sensation. Or this is a, actually, it's a different virtue of the soul, I would say. This cannot be described by actually five senses. It's a different thing. So there are sensory aspects, psychological aspects, and other aspects, social aspects. So everything should be, so total pain should be looked at, whether this gentleman has got physical pain or psychological pain, or it has got social pain, financial pain, spiritual pain may be also there, existential distress. Then my existence has become a distress for me. Why I am not going to, I am not dying. I am 85 years old. 90 years old, what is the function I am doing in the family or in the society? What is my function? I should die. God, give me that. So all these things are happening in his mind. And then if you talk to them, then you understand what is going in his mind. What is his agenda? What he feels about him? That is important to know. This is the prevalence. So about so many people are suffering from pain. I need not to tell you that all are here. The August, August uh, gathering is there. So pain is very common, very common. And knee pain is the most common. So next, Dr. Naveen Malhotra is going to dwell upon that. Knee pain, we have done the survey, two surveys, national surveys done on chronic pain. And we have found that knee pain is the most common and second pain is backache. This is the survey one. And we have done this in 2013. And we second survey was done again. And this is both. So in previous survey, we found 13% population in India suffers from chronic pain. That means they are taking painkillers. They are not going to the office. They are not participating into daily chorus. Ladies are especially. And they are suffering into pain. They cannot do their work. They are taking tablets. And they are generally taking over-the-counter drugs, like NSAs. 80% of these populations in this survey, 5,004 people were interviewed throughout India. And in this survey, 6,000 people were interviewed face-to-face uh, -face, uh, across India. And 19% population was suffering from, from pain in this uh, population. So you can find how many people are. And they are all taking, both surveys told us that they are all taking over-the-counter bovrans and combiflams. So you can understand that how much they are actually harm harming their organ systems. So this is common, going on everywhere. So which are the common pain syndromes in elderly? Neuropathic pain, then there are musculoskeletal pains because there is a degeneration going on. Then there are rheumatologic pains. And there are, of course, in older age, cancer is more common. And chronic diseases are also there, like CCF, renal, COPD, Parkinson, chronic pancreatitis, ischemic ulcer. Every disease adds to the pain also. And pain assessment is not relying on changes in vital signs. If somebody's blood pressure is 110 upon 70, you think that he is not looking in pain. Or he doesn't look in pain, he is talking nicely. Or he is taking that, he is talking that uh, my, uh, I have not slept for one month. And he doesn't look like uh, that much that he is so sleepless. So these perceptions are wrong. Okay. And knowing how much a procedure or disease should hurt, so you preempt in your mind that how much it should, whatever biopsy I am doing, or bone marrow biopsy or anything is doing, this should hurt, or I will give just paracetamol IV one gram and it should be okay for him. So don't think that way, that every one size doesn't fit all. Assuming a sleeping patient does not have pain, so some nurse goes into the room and patient was sleeping, she is writing 0 upon 10 pain. 
ideally it should be written at in that column at 8 pm or 9 pm or 10 pm or 12 night sleeping not she should not write whatever her own assumption is assuming a patient will tell you they are in pain so until unless you ask them how much is your pain so pain should be actually uh, posted as a fifth vital sign that means tpr temperature pulse and respiration and blood pressure are four signs and fifth sign is uh, pain score so pain should be established as a fifth vital in america in 2000 first january 2000 pain has become established as a fifth vital sign so all the patient even for diarrhea or malaria when they are lying in the and they, they are admitted in the hospital they are asked how much is your pain and they say no pain so they go on writing no pain no pain zero pain zero pain zero pain okay but they will be asked every four hourly because all the tpr and blood pressure are charted in admitted patient four hourly so pain should also be embedded i have written to uh, health minister central health minister when i was president that it should be made so they said that it will take an, at least 10 meetings in Nirmal Bhavan to declare this pain as a fifth vital sign. It's a very difficult task for us. We have to discuss with the nurses also. It should be passed from the nursing council also. So it could not be done. And what is the interdisciplinary expert consensus assessment on assessment of pain in older elderly population is that patient self report is of course believable. You have to believe the self report. 73% of cognitively impaired patients who are in moderate pain able to report on a four point verbal scale. Four point are that no pain, mild pain, moderate pain, and severe pain. Just keep it simple. Don't give too much of complicated pain scale. Otherwise, they will not be able to tell you. Just four points are written on mild, moderate, severe, and no pain. Painful disease and professors, of course, behaviors is also. Behavior will also tell you for non-cognitive or non-verbal patient. Pain report from the family members can be also counted and written. Response to the empirical treatment. If you give just one gram of paracetamol and patient becomes cheerful after one hour of that, you think she was, he was in pain. So this is empirical test. So strategies for pain management uh, assessment in elderly population is that all should be screened for pain. Cognitive screening should also be done. Sensory impairment, vision and hearing loss should also be counted into this because many will have uh, may not be able to see your pain scale. Many will not be hearing you properly that what you are asking, not deciphering what is the meaning of that scale and all that. Why, why you are you asking this? So keep it simple, give examples, give time to them, solicit self-report and use a valid pain scale, determine the liability of that scale. And many times I ask, how much is your pain right now? Tell me. So many elderly or many patients of mine in cancer situation, they say, right now there is no pain. Then, then when is the pain? So this is start a conversation. Many patients will come, doctors have you have given morphine to me. I have taken four times a day for last 10 years, but it doesn't work. Nothing is happening by this tablet. Your treatment is not working at all. Then I ask, how much is your pain? And, and today, right, right now you are sitting in front of me, how much is your pain? And right now there is no pain. Then I will ask second question, when you have taken the tablet, then question, their answer will be more often than not. Today I have not taken the tablet. Then you will understand that this gentleman is taking the tablet as soon as basis. When the pain occurs, he takes the tablet of morphine and that takes one hour to act. And then again, after two, three hours, that effect wears off. And then again, he goes into pain. So in total, he's telling your treatment is bullshit. I'm not happy with that. So find out what is the story about it, whether he's suffering from breakthrough pains, his background pain is controlled, but he has got in between flare of pain due to certain activities, due to coughing, due to passing the motion, so you have to ask these things. And these are the simple pain scales by faces. Faces they can identify very easily. Okay, so you can make the faces and see. This is a pain thermometer, Iowa pain thermometer, which can also be shown. So down, there is no pain, up, most painful. 
So how to assess in non-verbal patients? So these are the various the points on which you have to see, rubbing the, they are, they are massaging or affected the part, whether the patient is moving or rest, becoming restless, verbal complaints, he is doing ouch when you are changing the, in the bed seat or something, or you are making, when he is taking the turns in the bed, he is actually crying or something like that, or groaning, moaning, gasping, sighing, all these signs you can also make out. Delirium can also be caused by these factors. And post-operative delirium may be also due to severe pain. Haloperidol may mask the pain behavior. Okay, many times you give for nausea, vomiting, but it will mask the behavior. So he may be having pain, but he said it is not able to tell you what is happening to him. These are the various pain scales. You can see here some more than 20 pain scales have been researched. So these are the our research. So we keep it simple in India. And we are talking here the clinical pulse of pain management in elderly. We are not into research. So these are all research uh, assessment scales, I would say that. So well, of course, if you want to do any research, you can use these uh, pain scales. There are a lot of pain scales given here for elderly population. So general pain management principles are that you have to use a comprehensive pain assessment, identify pain type, examination should be done, comorbidities and problems, and medication list should also be understood. Many patients are on more than 20 pain medications, more than 10 medications, not pain medication. But when you are writing, you should understand already patients are on 20 medication. So how to uh, actually give that drug, which doesn't interfere with the other medication. Or sometimes if they go to the, now this is the actually era of super specialty. So when they are giving to cardi going to the cardiologist, he writes seven medicines. When you go to rheumatologist, he writes seven medicines. So everybody writes PPI. Everybody writes some sedative. Everybody writes something, something. So sometimes they become multiplied also. So you have to see the entire list, what can be reduced. And they have done, they have made actually some program also, computer program where they can reduce the drug. 30% medication list can be reduced by that and the patient becomes better after reducing the pain med in, uh, uh, total medications. And this is the, uh, a paper from 2014, a systematic review. So how to manage persistent pain in older population and these are the drugs. So of course, oral paracetamol is best and it can be given in the same dose as uh, younger adults. So four gram is the dose. You can use the four grams, up to four grams safely in the so there is no dose reduction for paracetamol. Oral NSAID should not be recommended for long-term use. And multimodal approach should be strongly recommended. Opioid should be started very low dose and go slow and go then ahead. Non-pharmacological approaches should be used also. Multimodal approach should be strongly recommended and combination of both the therapies. So this is the general picture that you find that after repeated or continuous pain, they become depressed. So evidence for attempting empirical trial is that if you can give safety to paracetamol TID and that reduces negative behavior, of course, 75% psychotropic drugs are also discontinued. So that is the effect of doing the empirical trial or a standard assessment treatment protocol that significantly reduces the discomfort in the old age homes. Regular analysis improves the socialization of the patient. So these are all the studies which has done the just empirical trial also reduces pain. And these are the various drugs uh, which can be used. This is for acute setting as well as you would say in chronic setting. And the, 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 every every uh, recommended dose here they are suggesting 20% reduction. This reduction, that reduction, go slow, go slow, go slow study. So these in in acute setting. Peripheral IV, uh, peripheral uh, nerve blocks can be given. That is very good. IV lidocaine has been found very useful in elderly population without any side effects. Local anesthetic in epidural should be reduced the dose. Opioid, opioid, uh, epidural opioid should be, uh, dose should be 50%, just 50% than the normal one. If the, if it is thoracic epidural, ab absolutely the two milligram we use morphine, then you can use one milligram in this population. So pharmacology alone rarely optimal for chronic pain. Okay, drugs may be control acute pain, but not the chronic pain. 
it has to be multidisciplinary approach and they are temporary intervention drugs are temporary intervention to facilitate patient adaptive self management techniques physical activation cognitive restructuring and sometimes nerve block also so nsaids are actually plain killers okay naproxen seems to be least harmful uh, if you use at all and this is the study of risk of acute mi with the insert cardiac death with the coxev drugs versus nsaid if you can see the celecoxev is the safest here and rofecoxib which is not used now was showing the uh, odds ratio of 3.15 okay even this other nsaids are also 1.16 here you can see naproxen here 1.18 so chances of uh, mi is more if you use more coxib like atorecoxib and celecoxib are very common thinking that they will reduce the acidity and if you see this uh incidence of hospitalization by gi bleeding with the age how the nsaids are increasing the bleeding gi bleed it is going just going the vertical so at 8 and 80 and 90 you can see nsaids should not be used at all and these are the endoscopically confirmed gi ulcers as the green bar diagrams are celecoxib and brown are non selective nsaids so the chances of with as the age increases chances of endoscopically proved or confirmed ulcers increase so these are the general guidelines for prevention of nsaid related ulcers if the low cv risk nsaids alone should can be given if it is a moderate gi risk nsaid should be given with the ppi always or coxib should be used or alternative therapy if the high risk is there if high cv risk but low gi risk then naproxen with ppi moderate risk naproxen plus ppi and high risk gi and high risk cv avoid nsaids at all and coxib also no no nsaid no coxib so opioids are not panacea that you think that i won't use nsaid i won't use paracetamol but i will just use paracetamol morphine everything be fine because opioids are considered safe it is not like that they can be safe but you have to start because elderly population is very very sensitive to this okay so start go slow it starts slow it stays slow but go and study okay so not remain that and um, further there are american geriatric society guidelines for uh, various uh, neuropathic pain medicines here so uh, this is not reptilian should not be used amitriptyline should not be used because of anticholinergic side effects moderate and strong evidence gabapentin is also adverse effects are limiting their use duloxetine there are no evidence muscle relaxant no evidence corticosteroid are also having too much side effects so should be avoided so non pharmacological approaches are this so many non pharmacological approaches which patient likes actually or some patient may not like it. so you have to see the their liking and american pain study again given the quality of evidence and strength of the recommendations for cognitive behavioral therapy exercise program and self management education program so all these things are quality of evidence is strong and strength of evidence is also strong so they should be used everywhere wherever it is possible implementing a total total pn here plan is very very important so in the follow up this is this take the main emphasis on that determine the patient goals are met so always your aim should be in the pain clinic measure the pain set the objective and try to meet the goal okay set the objective that how much pain relief you can give to the patient measure pain and try to meet the goal okay so goals are met or not met if not met then reinforce the treatment structure and adherence and review the treatment goals watch for the adverse effect so take home message with my presentation is pain is unrecognized untreated in older elder population understand goals and expectation it's a complex scenario because your patient is having cognitive problem demented may be demented he has got lot of chronic diseases he is on many medicines adopt a pol pol multi modal approach multi disciplinary approach combine pharmacologic and non pharmacologic approaches with rehabilitation teach the self management skills to the patient with that i will just close and the patient perspective slide is last so patient perspective is the actually not last but main slide 
that it is not cancer, it is pain that is killing me of the patient. All the patients say like that. So for that, people may not remember what you said, what you did to them, but they will always remember how you have made them feel. So always make a repo like they are your elders and give them too much respect when they are coming to your, in the clinic. Ask them properly, like you are talking to your uncle and all that. So that will also reduce their pain by 50%. At least this doctor is very good. So make them feel as a person. Okay? He is respected, welcomed in this clinic. Don't just remaining as a curing role of a physician. Take a caring role of a physician. So with that, I will close my presentation. Thank you for organizer. Thank you, ICA. And thank you, Dr. Jadon, Dr. Radhakrishnan, Dr. Jayasri Shu, Dr. Gedu, and my other colleagues. All our eminent pain physician here. So with that, I will close. Thank you again. Thank you, Jain. It was a wonderful presentation. I think you covered almost all the aspects of the pain. I'm very happy and very impressed one. Let's see what are the questions from the audience afterwards. Sir, questions will be in the last, sir. Okay, done. Fin. Fair enough. I think we can come to the next speaker now. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, just to mention, as Dr. Jain has mentioned, that government is not very proactive in taking up the pain as a fifth vital sign. But uh, as you know, sir, now many hospitals are trying to go for the NABH accreditation. And this is one of the primary requirement that the patient should be monitored for the pain. And many hospitals now they have started using this uh, four hours scale along with the other parameters. And uh, in that regard, my hospital also started. So I'm very sure of that other hospital must be trying it. Now I will, uh, just to continue, I will call upon Dr. Anil Agrawal, sir, uh, to introduce the next speaker and his topic. So Dr. Agrawal, sir. Hi, good evening everybody. It's a pleasure to be part of this CME and more so inviting my friend, Dr. Naveen Marotra. Actually, he needs no introduction. He's so close to our hearts. He's a senior professor and head in pain management center and, is, and his area of interest is management of chronic pain. His achievements, as we all know, is our most loved secretary of Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, and he has been awarded with ISA Bhopal Award for Academic Excellence in year 2015. He is KPR Young Anesthetist National Award. He got in 2009. He has got 195 publications and around 400 presentations to date. Dr. Naveen shall be speaking on management of knee pain and a very important area regarding patient suffering. Dr. Naveen, please. Thank you, Professor Kanil Gewal, sir, uh, for this kind words and warm introduction. And uh, greetings to all my respected teachers, Dr. P.N. Jain, Dr. Gedu, Dr. B. Radhakrishnan, sir, and dear Dr. Jadon for this kind uh, invitation, Madam Jashil Shur, and dear Dr. Malika Jai. I bring with myself greetings from PGIMS Rota Karayana, where I'm currently working. And this is our OPD complex where the pain management center is situated. I can say that last two decades have seen an explosive growth in the scientific study of pain and anesthesiologists taking up pain medicine as an exclusive career and becoming the pain physicians. And the implications for we the anesthesiologists are that we can build an exclusive career in pain medicine as we are well versed with the art and science of treating pain and our role as pain physician is a natural extension of our professional work as anesthesiologists. Many of times we hear that anesthesiologists are at times behind the scene. They don't get such due recognition by patients in society. So this is waning now, but this problem is not there for uh, anesthesiologists who practice pain medicine because they are in direct contact with the patient day in and day out. So don't worry if you're not there where you want to be, because great things take time. This is the Dar Nivaran Kendra at PGMS Rotak, where I am working, and it's a good OPD complex, one of the largest in the northern India. And uh, I'm happy to share with you that we have got 
just like any other opd of medicine orthopedics or gynae a huge rush there with a footfall of around 150 to 175 patients per opd and around 30 to 40 blocks are performed as a day care procedures in the pain ot in the pain management center itself and two exclusive ot's for fluoroscopic guided blocks on mondays and thursdays where around 20 to 25 blocks are performed and ug guided blocks are performed on wednesdays and this is our pain ot in the pain management center a six bedded recovery room and big waiting area which can hold around 60 to 70 patients at a time coming to my topic management of knee pain we are all going to suffer from uh, knee pain our seniors our teachers and as we grow old we all are going to have knee pain and the most common cause is osteoarthritis related knee pain and this will occur in more around 40% of patients aged more than 60 years and the commonly involved structures are uh, intra pain is coming from intra articular or articular structures and where nociceptors are present there may be associated synovitis effusions and meniscal abnormalities briefly i won't be touching much anatomy of knee joint it is the largest joint uh, two condylar joints uh, uh, the tibio femoral joint and one uh, patellofemoral joint and it is a modified hinge variety a synovial joint which has got a synovial membrane which lines the capsule and it reduces friction between the articular surfaces of the bones and it extends anteriorly and posteriorly to form multiple multiple parts of the knee nerve supply is important for us as an anesthesiologist and the most common uh, nerves which we target are the genicular nerve the its groups uh, which are coming from the tibial nerve the superior medial inferior medial and middle one and the common peroneal nerve gives branches to the lateral uh, aspect of the genicular nerve Osteoarthritis is the most common form of chronic arthritis, and in it exerts a significant burden on individuals. And the community as a whole, there is decrease in quality of life and increase in healthcare costs. It can be primary, which is more common than the secondary osteoarthritis, in which it usually occurs in uh, elderly where there is no previous pathology, mainly due to wear and tear and age-related changes. Secondary osteoarthritis can be because of injury. previous infection rheumatoid arthritis other deformities and obesity risk factors in pain clinics day in and day out we see such patients especially if you are attached to centers where rural background people are also coming and in those societies where lifts are not there there are there are patients uh, who are doing lots of work in the fields uh, sweating sitting on their knees while they are washing while they are cooking while they are doing uh, this scrubbing of the floor and excessive uh, stair climbing if lifts are not there in the society and in the younger one also knee pain is coming up because they are also sweating a lot the clinical features are uh, pain stiffness swelling crepitus and gradually as age advances the various deformity and effusion can also be there the most common assessment tool uh, which we use for osteoarthritis knee are uh, the womack scale the western ontario and mcmaster university of osteoarthritis index and here in we sometimes we exclude such some parameters from womack index because they are not applicable to indian context also there are other scales also like medical pain questionnaire and chronic pain grade scale depending upon your own choice you can choose but womack is quite popular investigations which are done are uh, we definitely do an x-ray knee uh, at views uh, standing ap and lateral and we can see the osteophytes loss of joint space subcondral sclerosis and cyst formations and the commonly used classification is scale radiographic uh, grading criteria the calgary lorenz in which the grade 1 is doubtful narrowing uh, of joint space with possible osteophytic lifting fairly normal grade 2 is definite osteophytes and possibly of narrowing of the joint space grade 3 definitely there is narrowing of joint space some sclerosis is there and uh, bony contour is uh, deformed and in grade 4 there is marked narrowing uh, severe sclerosis and it's definite deformity of the bone contour with large osteophytes so uh, this is a grade 3 osteoarthritis uh, x ray and this is a grade 4 with uh, various deformity also coming in and almost spaces obliterated other investigations which are done 
or to ensure that the blood sugar is under control and the hypothyroid status is also under control because they can also lead on to joint swelling and blood sugar if you have to do some intervention that should be under control and then uh, if you want to rule out rheumatoid arthritis they are all clinical tests mri is done if you are suspecting some meniscal tears or uh, ligament tears or uh, which is the cause of uh, pain but usually it's a clinical examination followed by an x ray investigation treatment i can tell you treatment of chronic osteoarthritis knee is very very complex it is a very simple disease but the treatment is complex because you have to tailor it according to the individual patient the expectations of each and every individual patient is different and it is rightly applicable for uh, knee pain that the good doctor treats the disease but the great doctor treats the patient who has the disease so knee pain we have to treat the patient who has knee pain what are his or her expectations from his uh, life a teacher may, wants to go to school daily which has got no lifts and he has to climb the stairs his expectations are different a 70 year old man or a lady has got different expectations i can go to my go to washroom i can just prepare one cup of tea and do some worship they are our expectations so you have to treat each and every individual uh, differently and not as dr pn jain has uh, told uh, these majority of these patients are geriatric in the age geriatric age group we have to take care of their co existing uh, diseases what drugs they are taking and what are their other uh, abnormalities so a good doctor should observe record tabulate and communicate use his or her five senses maybe the sixth sense also be transparent and informative tell each and everything to the patient be honest confident and caring competent in your knowledge social and communication skills and have respect for the patient who is in pain the treatment modalities are uh, most commonly used are paracetamol 500 or 650 mg once or twice a day safe drug nsaids they can be used only for a limited period of time and opioid agonist tramadol is the most commonly used in combination with paracetamol but definitely we have to take care of their uh, adverse effects also at times if there is a, a long standing osteoarthritis knee and neuropathic component of pain is coming in then definitely we add some 50 mg of gabapentin at night time so that their sleep is not disturbed amitriptyline should not be added especially in males who have got benign prostatic hypertrophy of uh, prostate and otherwise also it causes lot, lot of sedation patient will have sedation patient will have feel thirsty he will take more water he has got bp he will keep on going to the toilet and there is chances of falling also uh, some uh, glucosamine and diazepam combinations are used uh, for some period of time and they have been shown to reduce pain and in some cases improve function also the other treatment usually which we have to do because patients would will come to us once they have taken all the medical treatment and they don't want to undergo the total knee replacement or they are not medically fit for uh, total knee replacement so the treatment is intraarticular injections and now there is different uh, uh, drugs are available uh, platelet rich plasma local anesthetic and corticosteroid combination visco supplementation with high molecular weight hyaluronic acid and in some places ozone is also used so uh, the most common which we are using nowadays is uh, platelet rich plasma and uh, definitely all are used like visco supplementation uh, single injection which leads on to improve lubrication of the affected joint normalization of synovial fluid production and improvement of the intraarticular environment patients are quite comfortable uh, getting injected platelet rich plasma because they themselves think that this is their own blood and uh, this is our own autologous component which we are uh, we prepared uh, in front of us the same day same time and it is being injected in our knee the susceptibility is very very high and it is an autologous concentration of human platelets in small volume of plasma where the platelet concentration is 4 to 6 times higher usually 4 times higher around 8 lakhs uh, per cubic millimeter Uh, which is higher than the normal platelet concentration in healthy patients blood platelets uh, derive growth factors they are stored in the alpha granules of platelets and they regulate the biological processes of tissue repair and it has got a potential to have a regenerative effect on body tissues and lots of lots of uh, cellular growth factors are there 
whether they are TGF beta and basic arbulus growth factor and so on and so forth. So what PRP does is that it simulates the formation of new cartilage. It slows down the progression of osteoarthritis by reducing inflammation. It produces more proteins to reduce the sensation of pain, and it eases friction and pain in joints by generating more joint fluid. In addition to knee joint, it has been used in other places also. So uh, typically, there are different machines which are available. They use pre-coolant. First spin is for platelet separation, and second spin is for platelet concentration. And there are dedicated kits for that. It is done in absolutely uh, sterile environment, and you inject it uh, under vision and ensure that the drug spread uh, is going into the all the compartments of the knee joint. We usually do it under fluoroscopic guidance. Yes, we can do it under anatomical landmark guided guidance also, but it takes uh, one or two uh, fluoroscope shots, and we are very sure that all the three compartments of the knee joint, the middle, lateral, and the medial, they all are. Covered, especially the medial one, which is most commonly affected. If uh, intraarticular injection of local anesthetic and corticosteroids uh, is usually done as an outdoor procedure, usually we do it under anatomical landmark guidance only. Medial mid patellar approach, 0.25 percent of opivacaine, 8 ml plus, around 40 milligrams of uh, corticosteroid, and we typically do it uh, as a daycare procedure, and patients can go home even after half an hour or so. The duration of action depends upon uh, the lifestyle which the patient is following, because it's not only the pharmacotherapy or intraarticular injections of the knee joint, but you have to combine it with the precautions as well as exercises. But uh, suppose such bulky knees come, uh, obese patients uh, with deformities and lots and lots of fat pads, they are definitely, uh, it is always better to do it under fluoroscope guided uh, injections, whether you do a PRP or intraarticular injection of the knee joint, 10 degrees slight tilt, and then definitely whether it is a grade 4 or, or, or osteoarthritis or grade 3 osteoarthritis, you are very, very sure that the drug has gone into the intraarticular compartment. It has not been superficial or gone too deep into the topical fossa. So these are all pictures of those guided injections, and you are confident that drug is into the intraarticular knee joint. If USG is available, then uh, that is also a useful tool where you can uh, delineate the femur, patella, and the Hoffman pad, and this is the knee joint. Once you inject here, the Hoffman pad goes up. So in places where USG is available, you can do a USG-guided uh, uh, intraarticular injection of knee joint. And if patient's affordability is there, then you can go for a high molecular weight uh, injection, single injection, uh, different uh, brands are available, and uh, it is also known to improve the disability as well as uh, pain relief. So different, uh, depending on patient's affordability, you can go for that. The other option from intraarticular uh, injections of whether it is local anesthetic and corticosteroid, PRP, or viscous supplementation with hyaluronic and capsid, the next is you can go for a genicular nerve block. Again, it can be done under fluoroscope guided or under USG guided. I am commonly doing with fluoroscope guidance. Three nerves have to be blocked uh, uh, in fluoroscope guided the inferomedial, superior medial, and the superior lateral. So you just do it under fluoroscopic guidance and uh, you can do the genicular nerve block. And this is a picture where three nerve blocks are in, uh, uh, injected, the inferomedial, superior medial, and the superior lateral. You can do it with local anesthetic and corticosteroids also, and subsequently, uh, or you can go directly for the uh, radio frequency uh, abrasion of the genicular nerve block uh, I commonly use the conventional one, uh, 60 degree, uh, 90 seconds, uh, three minutes, sorry. And uh, again, uh, three nerves are uh, attacked, the inferomedial, superomedial, and the superolateral. Now, third treatment is surgery, but we are seeing patients who have undergone intraarticular injection of who are required intraarticular injection of knee post TKR also. They say, sir, after surgery, we have undergone surgery also, still we are in pain, do something. So we have tried uh, if there is some chances of bursitis, uh, intraarticular uh, injection of knee joint, and even the genicular nerve block in patients who have uh, undergone knee replacement. And our experience of around 38 patients is 30 to 35% of pain relief, but still that gives lots of uh, satisfaction to the patients that at least our demand for analgesic is reduced. Some uh, institutes and some clinicians use uh, bupinofen patches also, uh, 
um, I personally don't have a good experience with them because these are old uh, patients and uh, uh, they, they, at times they can have fever and absorption can be rapid. But still, some clinicians use propinosin patch for osteoarthritis knee also, but I am personally not recommending it. The surgical procedures involve arthroscopic lavage, high tibular osteotomy, and total knee replacement. And that is beyond our scope. Once uh, they are not responding, then they can go for that. But we teach our patients very, very clearly that our role is 50%. You have to combine it with precautions that you don't have to sit on the floor. You don't have to squat, avoid excessive stair climbing, do quarter, uh, quarter strengthening exercises at least 15 minutes, three times a day. And with this, you can have a sustained pain relief with, a, with whichever uh, you, you go for it, whether you go for intra-articular injection of local anesthetic and corticosteroids. And I have seen personally that if patient is doing precautions and exercises, the pain relief can last from as less as three months to as high as four years also with a single injection, if the patient flexion is good, especially in patients who have got grade three osteoarthritis. Grade four, you have to be very honest with them, that okay, the pain relief will be there, and uh, but it, it, you may require a repeat injections. Usually you don't perform more than three injections of local anesthetic and corticosteroids uh, in an ear. Visco supplementation is depending upon patient affordability. PRP injections, uh, we clear, tell them clearly, that the pain relief will start after around three weeks or so. So please have patience till then. And you may, if, if required, we can repeat uh, PRP injections also. There are different protocols. Some repeat second after one week, but we usually repeat it after early, as early as one month, but preferably after three months. We also guide the patients that this is very easy, weight loss. Uh, weight loss is very, very difficult thing. It is easy as a doctor for us to advise somebody to do weight loss, but it is very, very difficult. And always, always tell them about a uh, good role of uh, physiotherapy, quadriceps strengthening, range of motion exercises, and avoid jumping. And if they can do cycling at home, that is excellent. And if some are uh, long enough, they can go for swimming. That's also good. Always, always advise the old people, avoid fall. And if you require a cane or walker, please use it, but don't fall. And uh, some of the patients avoid insoles in the... Uh, your foot pairs and knee braces also. So to summarize, the first treatment of osteoarthritis knee is precautions, exercise, and pharmacotherapy. Second is precautions, exercises, and interventions. And third is precautions, exercises, and surgical procedure. And even if still you have pain after surgical procedure, you come back to the same cycle: precautions, exercises, and pharmacotherapy. Precautions, exercises, and interventions. Um, I typically say in pain clinic. Mataji, you don't have to sit down, you don't have to sit down, you don't have to sit down, you don't have to sit down. You have to keep your breath, exercise, do it, 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 do it. So chronic knee pain management challenges is that you see all state of patients, from rural to ministers, they also have work, from doctors to their parents, from poor to rich, and you can perform basic to advanced interventions. You can go for a simple intra-article injection of local anesthetic in particular to right, or you can go for an RF also. And you can, uh, there is an opportunity for immediate interventions if pain score is very high, or you can delay the interventions according to the patient. The avenues are you can go for clinical research and training and teaching of your residents and your fellows, and you can establish pain medicine as a super specialty. And most, most importantly, you get lots and lots of blessings of patients, lots and lots of blessings of patients when they are pain free. So please master the competences of patient care, medical learn, knowledge, practice evidence-based medicine, have interpersonal skills, good communication skills with the patients, be professional. If somebody has referred to the patient and for some other, uh, has given some other block, please don't criticize if there is no pain relief with that particular block and have a system-based practice. To conclude, being a doctor requires balancing the roles of empathetic listener, expert, and authority. This is absolutely true for pain physicians. You should be not only a compassionate listener, who puts his patient at ease, but also able to establish authority as a doctor when the situation demands. You should not only demonstrate expertise at the level of your clinical skills, but also adapt at evaluating patient insight and becoming an ally. A pain physician is an ally of the patient. To conclude, it is based on, the management is based on good history taking, proper examination, relevant investigations and appropriate interventions. So it's an holistic approach. 
This is this work pictures are not my own, but they are all from a com combined effort of our paint team, which are working with me day in and day out in the interest of uh, pain relief, both boys and girls. And this was picture before COVID, and now also post COVID, also we are without mask at times. So finally, to my dear ones who wish to start career in pain medicine, one day or day one, you have to decide. But my advice is, don't wait for that one day. Today is the day one and start planning to have a career in pain medicine. Because magic is believing in yourself. If you can make that happen, you can make anything happen. There are three mantras to be successful. Honesty, sincerity and hard work. Follow them in letter and spirit. I bow down my head in front of all my teachers and parents because of their teachings and blessings. I am here today talking on management of knee pain. Thank you very much. Finally, we have not lost faith in God, but we have transferred it from God to the medical profession. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen, for an excellent presentation and more so motivating our young colleagues to pick up pain at the earliest. Now I think we can go on to the next speaker, Dr. Ashok. Yeah, thank you very away. much, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Keeping on with time, uh, may I request our next speaker, Dr. Babita Ghei. Uh, she doesn't require any introduction. Of course, she is such a senior pain physician and very renowned nationally and internationally. So it is my proud privilege to introduce her as a formality that currently she is professor and in charge of pain clinic at PGI Chandigarh. She has to her credit, many, many senior and very important positions as a, a manager and administrator of pain. She has been a IASP core member in the planning of the pain and discipline as a pain. She is also uh, awardee of many awards to her credits. And uh, she has uh, almost more than 150 index publications and book chapters in the national and international books. Uh, with that, her area of interest is pain management, education and research. And of course, non-clinical skills, which is coming in a very big way. So, so many things to her credit without wasting any time. Let's listen from Dr. Babita Gay on the pediatric pain. She will be talking today. So may I request Dr. Babita? So stage is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ashok. Thank you for your kind words and kind introduction. Uh, first of all, my sincere thanks to the ICA team, especially Dr. Radhakrishnan, Dr. Jayashree Sood, Dr. Sanish, for their persistent efforts and uh, making me the part of this uh, session. And uh, happy to see that uh, the ICA webinars have progressed through the and almost reaching to the century. So this is a 98th webinar. Uh, without wasting much time, I'll be talking about a topic assigned to me that is pediatric pain. So let me take you to uh, the second vulnerable group after the first two speakers have spoken uh, more focused on the elderly population. Another vulnerable population is pediatric pain. So this will cover the whole uh, the spectrum of uh, the pain management from the different ages from elderly to the pediatric pain. Before I move further, uh, I don't have any disclosures or conflicts of interest, except for my uh, disclosure is that as a speaker, we all uh, are so passionate about delivering a talk that we try to manage a balance between the content and the delivery uh, as well as the time balance. So uh, I'll uh, try to finish my talk as far as possible in 2022 of 21 minutes, the time assigned to me. Uh, what should be the flow of my talk? What should I be talking? Why we have chosen this population that is pediatric uh, pain? Why this talk? Myths about pediatric population pain management, facts, uh, overcoming those myths. Then I'll be moving to pain assessment and the pain management. I shall be touching procedural pain, post-operative pain and chronic pain in pediatric patient. However, I may not be able to cover the uh, all other spectrum like uh, we know occlusive diseases of the sickle cell or palliative care or the cancer pain management, which may go beyond the preview of this talk. Uh, so as I said, why do we need to discuss the uh, pediatric pain management? We all know that non the 
children are non verbal and uh, cognitively immature hence they are vulnerable population and they need uh, a special attention with regard to the pain management also the data from various uh, children hospitals reveal that the pain in pediatric uh, population is extremely common under recognized and under treated if we see a re recent systematic review it shows that neonates who are admitted to the icu suffer through an average of around 7 to 17 painful procedures per day which includes venipuncture heel lance insertion of peripheral venous catheter and maybe some of the procedural uh, pain procedures which they are under undergoing and in the vast majority of these infants no analgesic strategies have been employed there have been lots of myths about the pain in children that we all consider or maybe few of us consider that infants are neurologically immature hence cannot probably conduct pain impulse and they may feel pain less infants because of the cortical immaturity do not remember pain and they might not have a long term impact of the pain persisting and children do not report pain while playing and sleeping hence we might methodically consider that uh, they must get over this pain quickly and may not be experiencing it, hence not expressing. However, these are all the myths and the facts are absolutely different about these myths. So to overcome these myths, let's talk about the neurobiology of pain in children. Uh, even the most premature neonate has a neural pathway required for the nociception, which hence responds to the pain and potential tissue damage. At birth, peripheral nerve myelination is completed and all the elements of nociceptive system required to process the pain stimulation is present. Also, the C fibers are matured in the pattern of their firing, though the central synaptic connection in the dorsal root are uh, dorsal horn are initially immature of these C fibers. However, the wind up, which can be which is usually produced by the C fibers in adult, this wind up can be produced by the low intensity A fibers. Uh, instead of uh, C fibers in pediatric patient in neonates, hence the A beta fibers initially extend up to the lamina 1 and lamina 2, wherein the C fibers are there uh, in the adult. On, and these uh, A fibers, they withdraw from the uh, lamina 1 and lamina 2, only the C fibers uh, connections have matured. This takes around six months. Hence, there is an overlap which is likely to contribute to the large receptive field on the dorsal horn leading to wind up phenomena. Hence, what is the implication of this that even the non painful stimulus can cause the wind up phenomena in, which in neonate or the infant. Also, the inhibitory pathways in neonate and infants are not fully mature and they become mature during the six months. The inhibitory pathways like descending inhibitory pathways, diffuse noxious inhibitory control, local interneuron, all these are not fully mature up to six months. On the contrary, the excitatory fire, uh, pathways are at the higher concentration and they have the more generalized distribution uh, in the dorsal horn in the early development. Hence, uh, rather than once thought that the neonates are being less sensitive to painful stimuli, they have more generalized and exaggerated response uh, to the low intensity fibers, that is A fibers, and which can also produce painful stimuli during the early development. So let's come out of this myth that pain, the children either do not feel pain or they have less pain. Also, because of the cortical immaturity, once thought that the, the pain may not have long term implication is totally wrong and that myth needs to be broken that even if the pain is not expressed as a conscious memory by the neonate or the infants the biological and uh, the impact is long lasting and it can alter the brain development in the longer sequences and may lead to hyperalgesia and behavioral changes in later in the life so the golden rule is what is painful to the adult is painful to infant and child unless proven otherwise so we should be treating pediatric patient with the same uh, sensitivity as we are treating adult. So moving on to the general uh, principle of pain management now. The first rule of pain management is to adequately assess the pain, reassess, anticipate and prevent and then further manage using multimodal approaches. So I'll be talking about the clinical assessment of pain. Pain assessment is a prerequisite for optimal pain management. Regular assessments and reassessments are required for the improved pain management and increase patient, parent, and staff satisfaction. Pain is considered as the fifth vital sign as was told by the previous two speakers. Dr. Uh, PNGN has highlighted well about it. And pediatric pain assessment is a challenging situation. Why so? Because 
pain is usually a subjective uh, phenomena and the self report is considered as a gold standard for assessment of pain which is missing in most of the pre verbal and small verbal children with cognitive impairment we should follow a rule of quest that is question the patient parent and the carer use the pain rating scales whatever is the standard operating protocol of the institute evaluate behavior and physiological sign to supplement those pre pain assessment tools secure family involvement take cause of pain into account and take action to assess the effectiveness pain assessment various pain assessment tools are available in children as i mentioned that self report is missing so the pain, in most of the children uh, only the verbal children can explain the self report of the pain so the pain assessment tools can be divided into physiological measure observational measure composite measures or the self report the physiological measures of acute pains are usually these that a dilated pupil increase perspiration increase heart rate increase bp decrease urine output and most of these physiological parameters are included in the composite assessment tools of the pediatric patient infant response to the pain is usually seen by the facial expression that is forceful closed eye lowered brows deep and furrows squared mouth and the cupped tongue and these are also been implicated in the flack or the face scale of the infants toddlers and preschool usually have limited uh, uh, ability to cognitive cognitively display and express the pain intensity as well as understanding the reason of the pain so they find out very different words to express the pain so parents and the care takers can be questioned about what do they usually express the pain in different words and they may point to the pain by the verbal expressions by the pointing expressions and faces is a good tool for them in the toddler at the preschool age group school age group children are usually they have ability to communicate and the self report or the face scale and the visual alert can be utilized for them so uh, the pain assessment tool whatever is there though there are uh, many tools are available which i will be touching in the few next slides should be age and uh, according to the age and cognitive level of the child they should be used in the uh, particular setup and you should also be used so there are various tools which can be which can be implied in various institution and each institution might have a different set of uh, pain assessment tool being used in the pediatric patient but what is extremely important is that you should know what policy is followed in your institution what documentation is done in your institution you should know that and you should follow that and practice that and be master in that so let's talk about the various pain assessment tool based on the uh, age of the patient post operative pain assessment tools for neonate and infants these are few of them premature infant pain profile cries comfort children and infant school uh, we had uh, in past reviewed this uh, pain assessment tool in elaborate and i would request the delegates to go through this review article which has elaborately covered various pain assessment tools which was published in, in pediatric anesthesia pain assessment tools for preschool children are cheops toddler preschool uh, post operative pain school flat and ops that is objective pain schools uh, pain scores children between 3 to age group 3 to 8 years usually have uh, can identify face scales or the color scales Uh, children older than age groups eight years usually can uh, have verbal description of the uh, pain and they can produce self reports and they can use visual analog score or numerical rating score uh, children with cognitive impairment the most reliable score is uh, non communicative children pain checklist post operative version nccp uh, pv and revised flag scores have also been shown to be very reliable this can also be applied to the intubated patients parents are nowadays extremely involved in the pain management because most of the pediatric surgeries are done in the day care uh, basis and pay, and the children are discharged uh, only few hours after the surgery so the parents have parents pain assessment tools should be uh, told to the taught to the parents which should be easily um, applicable uh, and understandable to the parents so usually parents post uh, pain assessment tool for post operative pain is being this is a 15 uh, point uh, uh, pain measure which usually tells about yes or no and uh, more than six implicates the pain management uh, interventions to be needed these are just the glimpse of few of the uh, scales which can be uh, touched and so because of the paucity of the time i will not be going in detail with them so this is a uh, pipp this is cry scale uh, children uh, and infant pain scales uh, cries 
neonate uh, and nips which can be used for infants flat scales uh, what is extremely important is that a pain assessment tool whatever we are using should be developed in, according to the institutional protocol for the assessment the all the healthcare workers dealing with the pediatric pain should be well uh, trained and they should be using it frequently and they should follow the institutional protocol and regular assessment and reassessment should be done moving on to the next flow of my talk that is pain management a journal as i have already talked about the assessment of the pain let's move on to the pain management usually the journal principle is we should use multimodal approaches which has been emphasized in past in the two previous speakers that by the two previous speakers that multi, there is uh, no uh, go away from the multimodal approach it has to be used as a multimodal approach a lone medication does not work we should involve parents and the caregivers and in pediatric patient as far as possible we should use non noxious route i'll talk about uh, various types of pediatric pain that is postural pain which has been highly uh, under uh, recognized and under treated post operative pain which we deal with day in day out, day out as anesthesiologist and a bit about chronic pain as we are turning into pro pain physicians cancer pain and sickle cell pain i would not be able to touch because of the paucity of the time needle pain in children is untreated needle pain causes huge uh, implications in long term it can have can have long term consequences of needle phobia pre procedural anxiety in future hyperalgesia avoidance of healthcare pain the child may not be reaching to the health uh, to the hospital resulting in increased morbidity and mortality there have been an offer of a for evidence based modality to all the children which should be used for the uh, any needle uh, procedure or the needle pain including the vaccination and it should not be used as a, a single modality uh, or any one of the single modality should not be used it should be used as a bundle so we should always be using topical anesthesia that is numb to numb the skin we should be using non pharmacological methods that is sucrose or the breast feeding Uh, the patient should be uh, held in the held in the comfortable position. We should we should not be grasping or uh, the children and uh, um, restraining the children. Do not hold the children down and age appropriate distractions like toys or um, any uh, mobile app or should be used for the children. In fact, CDC has emphasized. quite a lot on make the shot less stressful by by stressful by using nine things which you can do to you and your baby is do your research talk to the child to ask for the sweet solution which is sucrose breastfeeding if possible ask for the pain relieving ointment and the spray which be honest and calm do not use positive things that it will not you do not use uh, uh, positive things that things will be over no tell them the honestly that this might uh, pinch a bit but this will not hurt too much bring the child the favorite things distract your child big kids need support too so you should not you should always be explaining to the big kids and after care that you should be holding the child and the swaddling them moving on to the second uh, part of uh, the pain management that is post operative pain management which we encounter day in day out that is anticipate the pain depending on the type of surgery utilize different classes of analgesics we should use the multimodal analgesia control the pain as soon as possible and to allow the speedy uh, the to allow for the steady uh, serum levels use continuous or around the clock uh, around the clock dosing at fixed interval for management of severe pain we should not go into peaks and troughs of the pain so there should be a steady level of the serum so that the pain can be managed with the lower doses of uh, medication and other modalities address the side effects of opioid medication a uh, multimodal approach constitute medication regional anesthesia whenever possible be it a central direxel anesthesia cordal anesthesia peripheral nerve blocks local infiltration infiltration constitute an important part of multimodal analgesia um, integrative approach of non pharmacological modalities according to the age appropriate modalities should be used psychology that is uh, cognitive behavioral therapy whenever possible should be used spirituality for example chaplain use should be used and rehabilitation as for um, immediately in the post op period when the pain is reduced and in during the intraoperative period we should anticipate the peak effect the peak uh, incidence of the pain and inflammation and we should gauze our medication according to that so intraoperatively even before the pain starts intraoperatively medication can be used such as acetaminophen before the start of the skin incision can be so that the peak effect of acetaminophen uh, is peak with the peak effect of the pain patient and parent involvement is extremely important parents should always be educated 
and they should be provided the source of information. They can uh, make their children learn the techniques to help through the pain. They can also reduce the anxiety of the child. Patient, that is the child should also be age and uh, developmentally appropriate child should also be taught and uh, be given the information about uh, uh, the disease, the pain and the pain management techniques. Also, they should be um, uh, talked about the modalities which can control their experience of the pain. Hence, that will reduce the anxiety quite a lot. So we should be using non-oxious route. Administration of the analgesia should be through either through the oral or the intravenous route, which is already present. And we should avoid IM injections uh, at many at all the cost. The oral route is generally used for mild to moderate uh, pain and intravenous route is used for severe or the immediate pain relief. Moving to the pharmacology of the pain management, the various uh, pharmacological options are available. Before we move on to the from various pharmacological approaches, we should be uh, knowing about the age-related physiological changes uh, of the uh, pediatric patient. Neonates usually have a decreased fat, decreased muscle, and increased water, increased volume of distribution for volume distribution for, volume, uh, for the water-soluble drugs are seen. So there would be an increased duration of action for the some of the water-soluble drugs, and increased dosing interval might be required. Neonates do have decreased concentration of albumin and alpha-1 acid glycoprotein. Hence, there is an increased unbound concentration of highly protein-bound drugs and increased potential for the overdose and toxicity. Neonates do have the hepatic uh, immature enzyme system. Hence, the metabolism might be decreased and there might be increased uh, duration and decreased, uh, increased dosing might be required. Neonates and infants do have a decreased uh, glomerular filtration rate, hence the, uh, hence the elimination might also be delayed. And they do have increased oxygen consumption, decreased FRC, and may, may be more prone to the respiratory depression or the opioid sedative effects. WHO gladder, which is being used universally, is also being applied to the pediatric pain management for acute pain management. When the severity in the acute postoperative period is high, we go from strong opioid to the weak opioids, and in a conjunction with the uh, NSAIDs and acetaminophen for non-malignant uh, cancer pain, uh, we go from the step one to the step four. There are various non-opioid analgesics modalities which are available, uh, which can be used for mild to moderate pain. No side effect on the respiratory depression is seen because of that. The most commonly used medications are acetaminophen, NSAIDs, and COX inhibitors. COX two inhibitors are usually reserved for more than 40 kg of uh, uh, patients, wherein the other NSAID and acetaminophen is not work. So uh, this is the dosing for uh, various uh, acetaminophen. Oral dosing, you, if the child is less than 10 kg, 10 to 15 milligram with a duration of uh, six hours uh, um, uh, duration. For uh, more than 10 kg up to 12 uh, years, it is usually 10 to 15 milligrams uh, with four to six hours duration. For rectal uh, doses for less than 30, 10 kg, kgs at 10 days, it is 30 milligram per day every eighth hourly. For more than 10, it is 30 milligram. For infants and less than 12 years, it is 20 milligram per kg with a duration of four to six hours. Uh, with NSAIDs and naproxen, uh, ketorolac, ibuprofen can be used. Aspirin should be avoided and pay with the risk of uh, high fever or the RICE syndrome. Opioid and the, the maximum uh, recommended doses of, uh, uh, of acetaminophen in children is uh, um, uh, oral is, and rectal doses are 100 milligram per kg. Infants, it is 75 milligram per kg. Term and uh, preterm of more than 32, kg, 32 weeks is, is 60 milligram per kg. Preterm from 28 to 32 weeks, it is 40 milligram per kg per day. So opioid analgesics are usually used for moderate to severe pain and in the immediate post-operative period. There are various routes of administration. It can be IV, nasal, or uh, um, um, the most commonly used is nasal, which is in situ in for most of the uh, pediatric post-operative patients. There is uh, infants younger than three months to six months and have higher risks of hyperventilation, respiratory depression, which should be gauged and they should be monitored. And there, would, there is low risk of addiction in children.
uh, doses have been described for various, uh, uh, the various uh, opioids which are used are morphine and fentanyl in Indian setup. Though in Western setup, codeine, oxycodone, hydromorphine and methadones are also available. This is the chart which describes the dosing. The most commonly used are fentanyl IV. We use 0.5 to 1 microgram per kg, 1 to 2 hours, titrated to the response and morphine, which is uh, 20 to 50 microgram per hour. Per, uh, per uh, uh, kg uh, for one to two hours. Uh, we should be watching for the sites of uh, side effects of opioids. The, it should be anticipated and should be managed. Respiratory depression, nausea, vomiting, constipation, pruritus, and urinary retention. Um, Moving on to a word about patient and uh, control, nurse controlled uh, analgesia. Once I've talked about PCA, I'll be talking about a bit about the opioid side effect. Programmable pumps that allow patient or the nurse, uh, according to the patient cognition, wherein the patient is able to understand PCA should be utilized. And uh, PCA has been shown to have a good response, especially in the children over than eight years of age, uh, of age where better analgesia as compared to the morphine infusion has been reported. Uh, and uh, use, this is mainly useful for sickle cell vasoocclusive episodes, post-operative pain or the cancer pain and the palliative care. When we are using opioids, we should have a close monitoring of vitals as well as sedation. There should be particularly close monitoring, especially if the child has a history of OSA, a patient child has a craniofacial anomalies, infants who are younger than six months and older infants with a history of epinia and uh, prematurity, wherein the risk of sedation is there. So once we have... Um, talked about the side effects, uh, we should be always ready with the antagonist that is naloxone, which is opioid antagonist, and we should know how to prepare and the doses of one to two microgram per kg per minute is used in uh, conditions where the child is unresponsive to the physical stimulation, there is shallow respiration or there are pinpoints pupils. So if we have seen the, uh, the toxicity or the overdose of sedation, of the opioids, we should be treating it with the naloxone. Duration is usually 30 to 50 minutes. We should also not be leaving the child unattended as the child may need a repeated doses. Once the, the effect of the naloxone is short-lived, however, the effect of opioid may go long-lived. So a word about chronic pain in children, because the talk cannot be completed if we do not talk about the chronic pain in children. Prevalence of chronic pain in children is uh, nowadays been reported to be 20 to 40 percent worldwide, with 5 percent of children and adolescents being severely disabled by the pain. So number of the hospitalization due to chronic pain condition has been increasing over the last decade. And the mean length of the stay is almost twice that of a children without chronic pain. And some of these will, re will require readmission at least once within a year of their first admission. And the childhood uh, chronic pain is predisposes to the continuation and the de development of new and different types of pain in the adulthood. So predisposes to further uh, chronic pain in the adulthood. Also, the chronic pain in children has a, it's coming up as a modern public health disaster because it impacts all aspects of life, be it physical functioning, the social life, the isolation, mental health, all aspects, sleep hygiene. So there is an enormous direct and indirect financial burden. Huge burden has been reported because of the child or for the children chronic pain and augmentation in the healthcare expenditures reported in recent past. Various type of uh, chronic pain categories are nociceptive, neuropathic, nociplastic, and usually we see the mixed type of uh, pain that is uh, all the three components might be present. For chronic pain, the, it is pivotal to do a multidimensional assessment. In acute pain, we can do, may, be, may get away with unidimensional assessment of pain. For However, for chronic pain, LOP, QRST, UV is usually the mnemonics which I fo follow, that is location, onset, precipitating event quantity, quality, radiation, effect on sleep. So functional assessment, psychological assessment, health-related quality of life, red flag assessment, or yellow flag assessment should also be done for the chronic pain. Uh, and the uh, multidimensional uh, assessment is uh, been, uh, th this has been reported by the pediatric impact group that we should cover the multidimensional as We should have the multidimensional assessment for any chronic pain, especially the pediatric patient. Uh, for the uh, management of chronic pain, there is a need to shift from the biomedical to the biopsychosocial frameworks. Myths needs to be broken with evidence-based recommendation. The treatment of chronic pain and primary pain disorders in pediatric patient is uh, multidisciplinary. It is rehabilitation, integrated non-pharmacological modalities, psychology should be involved, normalization of the life, 
focusing on sports exercise sleep hygiene social life school attendance and the medication is usually just an adjunct and may or may not be required and medication include basic analgesia or the adjuvants like uh, the, the medication for neuropathic pain gabapentin clonidine amitriptyline etc so the take home message is we need to assess and reassess pediatric pain manage pain accordingly try to prevent adhere to the principle of pain management anticipate and prevent pain adequately assess pain use multimodal approaches involve parents and patient use non noxious uh, routes most of the time understand the pharmacology of non opioid as well as opioid related to the pediatric population approach and treat different types of pain accordingly thank you very much for the kind hearing thank you dr babita it was really a very lucid um, show you covered almost every aspect i think you didn't leave even a, any any point regarding the management of pain in the children uh, with that i would request uh, dr gedu to proceed further thank you thank you dr babita yeah thank you ashok it's time to introduce the last speaker of the day ashok who was the main host also for the day so <clears throat> ashok also again is a well known person as far as the pain management is concerned as well as academic things are concerned so ashok who is basically coming from tata motors hospital jamshedpur and he has got a multiple index publications also both national national and the international level he also had a coops best paper award that was being given and his area of interest is again intervention pain management labor analgesia and usg guided blocks so i think ashok jada you can start talking about the crps thank you very much sir for such a beautiful introduction and at the outset i would really um, show my gratitude to the ica who given me this opportunity to share this stage with the stalwarts of the pain management and anesthesia so with that i will start my topic i have given a topic today the complex regional pain syndrome as you all know it is a very very large topic however today i will just focus on the newer insights regarding its pathogenesis and whatever the concept has changed uh, regarding the management so with that what is the crps crps as the name suggest it is a complex because varied pathogenesis and dynamic clinical presentation it is a regional disorder it is a pain not like other painful conditions but always out of proportion to the inciting event and it is a syndrome as we all know many signs and symptoms are present so the constellations of the symptoms and the signs with that it is defined that it is a severe pain continuous pain disproportionate disproportionate to the time or degree which usually takes for healing it is regional and also have few cardinal features which are very specific to this in sensory motor pseudo motor vasomotor and trophic changings so what happens in this disease crps is actually multi factorial disorder and there is a nociceptive dysfunction which causes extreme sensitivity it brings about the neurologic inflammation which causes cns and ans deregulation leading to vasomotor dysfunction and all that leads to maladaptive neuroplasticity and outcome is functional loss and the disability as you can see in this chart in a normal consequence of the injury the biochemical and physical damage which has happened to the local tissue is usually heals within 3 months but what happens in the crps all the inflammatory markers pain processing the autonomic and endocrinal disorders and the immune responses they all go havoc and they continue for undecisive time that is the difference between the normal pain and healing and the crps situation so how it happens the beginning have beginning in the beginning there is a change in the local milieu by beta cell activation then there is a expression of the interleukins 1 beta and the substance p and it all causes sympathetic changes in the regional level which further leads to changes in the autonomic nervous system and affects the autonomic drive and 
but what is the mechanism which brings all these changes so there are many mechanism proposed like autonomic nervous system what happens there is a upregulation of the adrenoceptor responses there is a changes in the sympathetic nervous system by the reduction in the turnover of the epinephrine so epinephrine build up which causes further stimulation of the alpha 1 adrenoceptor primary afferent and then all the causes altered vasoregulation and mechanical allodynia and the punctate hyperalgesia which is classical for the crps not only that there is a changes in the cns also that there is a reduction in the cortical reorganization we all know our all organs are represented in the sensorimotor cortex but in the crps the affected limb presentation is reduces and there is also impairment in the endogenous pain inhibitory pathways of the brain and also there is the activation of the dendritic cells what was thought initially that in the matrix where the dendritic cells are present they are innocuous they are they, they are not participating in inactiv inactivation but now they are playing a very major role and more so in the crps and what it is been seen that there is, a, there is a increased glucose metabolism in the resting neural circuitries particularly those are uh, responsible for the pain perception so is there any evidence whatever i have just mentioned yes the degree of cortical reorganization is very much proportionate to the pain severity and the severity of the crps so when we treat such patients and the symptoms are decreasing there is a reorganization reversal occurs what it means that the representation which was decreased is again going or increasing in the size there is also enhanced functional connectivity between the areas which are responsible for somatic sensory and the motor conditioning there is a and these particular areas can be picked up by the functional mri that what are the changes happening in the before the treatment and after the treatment there are also few inflammatory mechanism like is a pro inflammatory cytokine storm situation there is also neuro inflammation as i said the pre or the glial cells they play a very important role and they lead to a neurogenic inflammation and there is a expression of the sp the substance p and the the gene related peptide also there is a few mechanism are related to immune system also like expression of igm and igg through their own proteins and abnormal t cells they increase in the numbers particularly cd4 and cd8 why it is important to mention here just to remind you these are coming in a very big way for the identification of the disease now it is possible to count them and then we can identify that this particular patient is suffering with the crps is there any experimental evidence for all these um, uh, immunologic uh, reactions or immunologic presentation yes it has been seen of course experimentally that if some animal is suffering with the crps and you take out the igg from that patient and then that animal and transfer to the another normal animal in a experimental model that that animal also developed the crps and very interestingly the crps will be occurring in that particular model limb only not otherwise there are certain genetic factor and epigenetic changes also been observed in the crps patient like it is noticed the crps occurring in the families and what is the reason they found that the human leukocyte antigen was abnormal in those particular patients and also few other genes are also been designated for the cause of crps then question comes that does psychological factors play a role because all pain physicians come across many patients they show either the sign of depression or other psychological disorders or the crps may cause the features of the depression and other uh, psychological disorders but fortunately it has been found by the systemic review and the meta analysis that the psychological factors are really not responsible for the crps of course it is a known factor that crps causes the mood changes and the illness itself causes this depressive features so what are the clinical profile of such patient usually it occurs in the middle age 40 to 50 years and very high preponderance in the female 4 is to 1 the upper limbs are mostly involved of course then the lower limb and the other parts can be seen like chest and other body parts 
the pain is always more than the expected. There is a swelling, loss of movement. There is a temperature. Limb can be warm or cold. There are skin changes depending upon the severity and the duration of the course of the disease. And very importantly, as I've already mentioned, these patients usually show depression and sign of hopelessness. But more than that, interesting is that they also present with the neglect-like symptoms. So this neglect can be the cognitive neglect where they feel that the limb is an alien limb. It is not their own part. And when you ask them to move it by distraction or by asking them to close eye, they always find it very difficult to move. And this is a new feature which is reviewed again and again in the literature and also a very pathognomonic for the CRPS. So what are the stages? The early stage with it happen in the within three months, it is the acute stage, which is followed by the dystrophic stage where the allodynia, swelling and the severity of the pain is the main feature. As you can see in this picture, this lady is avoiding even the air, contact with the air with the limb, affected limb, because she was saying that whenever she uh, removed this uh, towel, she feels pain. And then if you do not treat these patients or the treatment is not adequate, they go into the atrophic change and which causes the permanent damage and disability to that particular affected part. So how to diagnose? This diagnosis is mainly clinical because the investigations, whatever you do, they are really non-specific. So the diagnosis is based mostly on the typical history and the evolution of the symptoms. However, the Budapest criteria helps in the making of the diagnosis. So all the pain physicians, they started um, thinking of the idea that how to diagnose the CRPS and they, 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 uh, they had early meeting in 1993 and then they proposed a Budapest criteria which was implemented in 2003 and later modified in 2007. So what is important here? As I said in the beginning, the, they had four cardinal features like sensory, vasomotor, pseudomotor, and motor or trophic changes. So the patient has to have at least one physical sign in three of the categories, one uh, physical symptom in three of the categories, and one physical sign in either two or three of these categories. And without them, you cannot designate the patient is suffering with the CRPS. But what is the problem with this scale? It is a dichotomous scale. This only talks about whether patient is suffering the CRPS or not having CRPS. So it doesn't help you. It doesn't help you to communicate with your colleagues that what severity your patients are suffering. It also doesn't help to plan the treatment and discuss the uh, plan of the treatment, whether patient is really responding to the treatment or not responding to the treatment. So to overcome this obstacle, they harden comes up with a 17 is, uh, point score, that hardened score, which helps to quantify the disease. And we also can see in the perspective of the treatment that how patient is behaving. So there are actually two types of the CRPS, type one and type two. Type two, when there is a obvious nerve damage and type one, when there is a no nerve damage. The two other variants are also accepted but not, uh, rather it is still debatable, the CRPS NOS, where the one or other feature is missing from the requirement of uh, that, which I have already mentioned, the three symptoms and the two signs. And the CRPS with the remission, when you see the patient and patient says that, sir, before that, when I have problem, I had this feature and now it is no more, like pain or the swelling is decreasing or the changes are decreasing or there is a change in the temperature or, or the uh, nature of the swelling. So these are the remission features. So it is a lot of discussion is done, but it is still debatable. No, it is not a universally accepted norm. Now comes to the investigation. In the beginning, I said the investigations may help to your clinical finding, but they are not diagnostic, like thermography. If a patient is having hot limb, naturally you will get the hot plus in the thermography. A patient is having cold limb disease or the late um, CRPS symptoms, then you can see the, the blues or the lack of flow or the flush, it is shown in the thermography. The sweat testing, like pseudomotor changes, as we know, that changes in the uh, pseudomotor changes can bring about the abnormal sweating, which also other sympathetic disorder can cause. So it is not diagnostic. Like patchy osteoporosis, again, because 
there is a disuse dystrophy patient is not using or ambulating that particular area so osteoporosis can happen there you can identify the disease by autonomic testing by increased uh, threshold for the warmth and decreased pain sensation but it is again a, not a pathognomonic but only say there is a sympathetic change however the bone sensitography which is also uh, like included in the uh, current uh, diagnostic tool and which is very helpful particularly if we find out that periarticular accentuation occurring in the osseous phase is is, is, is not a pathognomonic but definitely it says that patient may be suffering with the crps similarly like nerve conduction and myography it just help that there is a nerve compressed uh, nerve compression or injury is there but two advanced tools are really quite helpful one of them is functional mri as i said the somatosensory uh, reorganization can be seen pre and post and also the oxygen demand or increased oxygen demand in the uh, resting uh, tissue which are responsible for the pain so we can pick up and we can also uh, quantify the disease we can also prognosticate the patient that uh, what is going in his uh, brain as far as the crps is concerned a very recently one electronic nose aeo nose is added which uh, which actually detects the volatomes which are the volatile organic compounds everybody has a different volatile organic compound composition in the axillary layer and it has been seen that the crps patient have a different set of uh, profiles in the axillary layer and can be picked up by the these particular but it is an still experimental uh, probably will be helpful in the future so we have already examined clinically we have found and the diagnosis of the crps is always by exclusion because many disease as enumerated here have almost similar a presentation like crps so we have to rule out all these features before we say that patient is having crps so now comes to the treatment physical therapy is the cornerstone for this uh, management of the crps as we all know the ultimate result is the disability and dysfunctional limb so that can be prevented by the physical therapy and it has been seen that early intervention by physical therapy in fact you can reverse the disease and you can prevent the disease progression and the other adjunct to the physical therapy like mirror therapy or desensitization or also help in that particular regard and like this review article and later on this cochrane review both have shown that the physiotherapy the graded motor invent, uh, inventory and the mirror therapy all helps in the pain, patient management however the evidence is low and of course because uh, many more studies are required before the ev strong evidence is comes up so comes to the drugs drugs are basically so far targeted to the symptoms and said for swelling gabapentin for neuropathic pain alpha and beta blocker for the the cold limb or warm limb vitamin c and the ans uh, and acetylcysteine are all scavengers we know antioxidants so there is a general treatment opioids usually to be avoided but in the beginning if pain is too severe opioid has to be given but you all know that what are the side effects of the opioid addiction and other things and of course or the negative effects on the t cells we all know the vasodilators and antidepressant are also added depending upon the patient symptoms but that was the symptom based treatment but what is the paradigm shift here is the that we etiopathogenesis our our treatment should base on the pathogenesis as we all know there are the four pathogenetic uh, mechanism like inflammation central and peripheral uh, central sensitization the motor disturbances and the vasomotor disturbances so accordingly we have to select the drugs and this particular algorithm is just showing in the two colors dark colors and the light colors which by evidence says that the dark color should be preferred over the light colors because the evidence is low for those light color treatments next is another um, non invasive treatment is the psychotherapy as we have seen many patient develop the depressive symptoms and it is been seen that these patients are suffer more when they have negative illness perception and both the things can be changed by biofeedback psychotherapy and hypnosis which are part of the psychotherapy what are the newer therapeutic options 
like intramuscular botox enakira which is one uh, one l uh, il uh, alpha blocker intravenous uh, infusion of immunoglobulin immunoglobulins or sub anesthetic infusion of ketamine here it is very necessary to mention the many treatment i am just um, escaping because it will take whole day to present the, the only treatment part of the crps but unfortunately whatever i have mentioned have the low evidence only intrathecal pump and the spinal cord stimulation are having little bit uh, better evidence which is again to be was shown in in year 19 and uh, 2013 but the current uh, evidence is really poor for intrathecal as well as the spinal cord stimulation also the deep brain stimulation came in a very big way and it was thought it will it will be a panacea for the treatment and uh, unfortunately it failed to achieve the primary and the secondary objectives which were the pain as well as the mobilization of the limb and moreover it has many side effects so the uh, risk benefit ratio is not favorable for this invasive treatment last but not the least slate ganglion and the lumbar sympathetic ganglion are the cornerstones for the in the current management plan and this should be started in the beginning because whether though it is a debatable because the many patient many people will feel that all pain are not sympathetically mediated so what is the role of these ganglion block but uh, i think all of us will agree that if we give this that decision will come later on but this will break the cycle of the pain and may facilitate the next step for the better management but one thing to remind you that even the first step failed then never think that it is not sympathetically mediated pain we all know if it is a matter of upper limb the sympathetic supply may be going for the kunz nerve so always if sympathetic of the slate ganglion is failed always give one try for the t2 t3 sympathetic block even if it fails then you can designate that this patient particularly is not having the sympathetically mediated pain and if your slate ganglion has given a good result but short lasting then you can definitely go for the neurolysis radio frequency neurolysis amputation it is controversial to cut rather than the suffer but unfortunately the other say even if you cut it you can't take away the problem because the crps can occur in the stump or it may go for the migratory disease for the another normal site and this is the algorithm which is uh, when patient comes you always give sympathetic block decide sympathetic mediated pain or non mediated pain then simultaneously start the pain management rehabilitation program and if the non invasive treatment is not effective go for the minimally invasive if it is not effective go for the invasive or the uh, the you can say the surgical part and psychotherapy it is not it is always in the parallel with the other management and if patient is doing well you can follow up and if fails you can continue from the stage 1 but this was the symptomatic or the symptom based treatment what is the change this is a very a uh, recent review uh, just published last month uh, what it says that you identify the pathogenesis and then you start treatment but this also says you start active physiotherapy in the beginning whatever pathogenesis may be and now it is possible to assay to sil2 or r2 uh, identification is a biomarker which talks about the t cell activity and if you find the high levels of the sil2 r2 and definitely a predominantly a inflammatory or the immuno uh, logic uh, uh, pathogenesis you start anti inflammatory and immunomodulatory drugs and if it is not then the predominant mechanism it is a clinical based which we have already discussed that what symptoms are there uh, whether limb is cold or warm what swelling what type of pain how much burning then depending upon that you can plan your analgesic uh, if therapy is adequate is good if it is not then you consider the minimally invasive and the non invasive uh, treatment as already suggested in the beginning but you know the what is the bottom line we know lot of things lot of newer insights have been developed but this recent survey tells us something different that when the international people or the pain physicians were asked then 50% face difficult to even diagnose to crps 
So not only the treatment and the uh, understanding of the pathogenesis will help, but also we have to bring about the knowledge of the CRPS our, uh, among ourselves and also the patient so who can report it earlier and get benefit of it. So to uh, summarize that it is severe in nature and complex to treat, no single therapy is solely effective. Multimodal approach as all three predecessors have used for the older patient and for the younger patient. So we have to approach by multimodal approach. Start the treatment early. Do not wait to confirm by investigation and diagnose. Always keep a high suspicion of the CRPS. Need not to go by the, uh, that until unless the three sign of uh, three uh, symptoms and the two signs are available. You start the treatment and use interventions early because it is seen that if you delay, then actually you are complicating the issue more rather than helping the patient. So to conclude, Though it is not, the conclusion is not with the sync of my presentation, but definitely it is giving a insight, which is we all foresee that the newer molecular research may help future for early diagnosis and guiding regarding and the guide regarding the treatment pathways. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. This was a very complex topic, actually very complicated one topic but still you went into pretty good details to explain it. Nice presentation, I can say. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And I think I keep up with the time also. <laughs> no, there was a notice in between that only 19 minutes left. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't matter. Ah, thank anyway. You. Think, uh, thank you, thank you, sir. Ashok, yeah. you will only take over. Who's taking over? You yeah, are yeah. Uh, Radha. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm just, uh, I'm supposed to take over and then uh, yes. answer, but uh, there is no uh, questions in the chat. So, uh, well, before we, had, that... we, had, we had already answered them in the chat. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were, so they were, yeah, yeah. Discussion on, uh, the I, some, some other time, sir, we can discuss all these issues, actually. Uh, uh, not, they were not too related to this topic, but they were related to, I think, uh, you to your topic that how to pursue for the uh, uh, career in a pain uh, specialty. Uh, One with that, uh, uh, Dr. Gedan, you can take it. Uh, I think there is one uh, question in the chat. Deblina has asked that is, ma'am, I think it is directed to me. Do you use tramadol in pediatric pain management, especially immediate post operative? If yes, what is the minimum age above which it can be used? Dr. Pasha M. So Dr. Pasha, um, answer to that is that uh, tramadol is not uh, recommended in less than 18 years of uh, age. And we no, don't use uh, tramadol in uh, pediatric patient. Yeah, thank you, right. thank you, thank you, madam. Yeah, uh, with that, I think no more questions. So we have saved a lot of time of <laughs> this question answer session because people have not asked. So may I request uh, Dr. Jashir Shrud um, for the proposing the vote of thanks. Uh, madam. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Good evening, I think madam. they have not asked because they have understood it so well. It was so well done. <laughs> and uh, I must uh, compliment the organizers in the sense, of course, I'm a part of it, yes, but this webinar has been so excellent is because of all the luminaries who have been included today, starting from Dr. Gedu, Dr. Jain, Dr. Anil Agarwal, Naveen, Bavita, Dr. Ashok, all of them are luminaries in pain management, and we have been so lucky that, that they've all given us, you all gave us time for the moderation and for the lectures. So that's really good. And thank you so much from the, from the core of our hearts. Thank and, you, madam. Uh, <laughs> this was madam. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Yes. And of course, the lectures were so well covered. It covered the whole spectrum of pain management, starting right from Dr. Jain, who covered the, uh, you know, the neglected population. Then, of course, Naveen did that very good job. Babita actually told us the tips, told the students all the tips, how to handle the kids. And Naveen gave the advice to the youngsters, what, how they should go about taking their areas of interest. 
and of course dr ashok discussed a very important point of course a little advanced but crps is so important in our chronic pain management so uh, you know i have no words to thank uh, you all thank you so much and it was such a pleasure uh, having you all here today i have a few uh, announcements in the sense that tomorrow uh, that next week that is eighth today is the first next week that is the eighth we will be having a webinar on attitude ethics in healthcare we should be moderated by uh, bavita ghai and for the students this is a very important area ethics research ethics etc communication skills which are very important so the topic attitude and ethics is very important and i'm sure we will all be there to um, listen to this webinar and of course 15th we are having celebrating our 100th the century which dr radha krishna had introduced again a very very important topic so thank you very much and see you all next week and thank thanks you, clarence thank you. and thank you thank you, thank you madam thank you very Sanish much for always being there thank you so much thanks a lot thank, thank you. you so much ma'am thank, 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 thank you good night thank you thank you dr radha krishna okay bye 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 we're closing here